This is the Middle Earth Philosopher, where I talk about ideas, people, and relationships within Middle Earth, and try to examine them from a philosophical point of view that could exist in that world. Now, the universe of Middle Earth is filled with historic lineages and families. And if you're familiar with it, which if you're listening to this, you probably already are, you are already familiar with one of the greatest ones, that being the House of Fenway. Now, Fenway's line is known for producing a series of high kings, both in Valinor and in Middle-earth, that shape a lot of the history and lay a lot of the foundations for further historical events that happen in Middle-earth. So, um, for obvious reasons, they would be the most well-known of the families and lineages in that world. However, there's another aspect to his family that I think kind of goes under the radar, and it's something that I notice when I read these stories. And that pattern, I guess you can say, is this history of manic emotions and extreme emotional reactions and depressions that a lot of them seem to fall into. Now, I know that a lot of people tend to think that, you know, because these are the Eldar and everything, that they're not supposed, they don't get sick, obviously, right? Because they're immortal. Um, so they wouldn't have any kind of mental illness, basically, right? However, if you look at what happens in his Finway's family and his line, it really puts a question mark on that. And if it's not a mental illness, then I guess in a way you can call it Finway's curse, which is what I'm going to refer to it as for the rest of this recording. So this trend begins with Finway himself, obviously, in that being the first High King of the Noldor is married to Muriel and they give birth to their first son, Feanor. Now, as I'm sure you're already familiar with, Feanor is such a powerful individual, even as a baby, that it takes all of, or nearly all, of Muriel's life energy just to give birth to him. And she's so weakened um, after the birth that she eventually just gives up her life, despite the urgence of her husband to you know, remain with him and help raise their family and grow a bigger family and continue to rule with them over the Noldor. That was their dream, essentially, I guess is implied. But that doesn't happen. And because that doesn't happen, Fenway falls into this deep state of despair where he is constantly visiting her body, which at this point is said to be lifeless. And to me, that's death because it says her spirit is gone, so there is no life in the body. That is death. It wasn't a violent death, fortunately, but it's still death. It's a lifeless body at this point. Now, what makes this so difficult for him is that he's essentially the first person in Valinor to experience this level of loss. The Valar have never experienced this kind of loss. None of the other elves have experienced this kind of loss. No one has this experience. So therefore, no one can console him or counsel him on how to deal with that kind of grief, that kind of um, despair. So he's literally feeling emotionally alone. He is the embodiment of no one understands me because that's literally his case. No one in heaven at that point, mind you, understands what he's going through. Now, as again, as everyone knows, he does have another family. He gets remarried and everything. But that step family is at odds with his son, Feanor, who, because it is the son of his first wife, his beloved, I guess you can say, that the majority of his love, the priority of his love, goes to him automatically because Fenway never emotionally lets go of Muriel. Her ghost still haunts the family, I would argue, for the rest of the first stage, to be honest with you. But regardless, that's the situation as it stands. And what ends up happening is that Feanor then becomes next in displaying these manic expressions. The first time being when Fenway is murdered by Morgoth, when he raids his home and steals Simmerals, and Fenway is the only one who stands up to him. Feanor, who was at this time being judged by the Valar because of a death threat that he made to his half-brother from Golfin, finds out along with the rest of them at the same time and he basically curses all of them out accuses them that this was some sort of plot 
even though the Valar and the rest of the elves had nothing to do with that, and he just completely loses it. And if you've ever been around someone who has experienced intense loss and falls into that deep sense of grief, then you know that rational, rationale and logic have no place at that point. It goes out the window and that person's just an emotional wreck. And that's Feanor at this point. And from this point on, even though he was thought to be kind of arrogant, though gifted and a genius before this happened, they hadn't seen anything yet now. Because now this is when Feanor goes mad, essentially. Because from this point on, Feanor starts making really, really rash decisions and giving zero fucks about it. He, as everybody knows, has the battle at Alcolande, steals ships, kills a bunch of elves to do it. He causes division within the Noldor so that one of his stepbrothers refuses to follow him and stays behind and apologizes to the Valar. Um, the other stepbrother decides to continue on, crossing the grinding ice in the far north because Feanor ditched him and that faction um, with the ships that they stole. And, you know, he's just. He's just off the deep end at this point. And the final expression of this for him is when during the, one of the first wars of Beleriand, when they arrive in Middle-earth, um, they are doing so well that Feanor gets too far to he ahead of his army. And he is ambushed by a bunch of Balrogs. And to Feanor's credit, he takes them head on. He is not terrified of them whatsoever, which that's kind of the Balrog thing is to scare the hell out of you. Again, Feanor gives zero fucks, and he fights them and does pretty well until eventually he is overcome by their leader, Gothmog, and mortally wounded. Now, at this point, he has a vision, and he sees now that Morgoth is not going to fall by the hands of the Noldor. He sees this clear as day, he understands this, and normally, if someone was thinking rationally, they would tell the people who followed after him that, hey, look, I made a mistake. Go back to Valinor, get your shit together, apologize, do whatever you need to do to get back into the good graces and have a good life, you know, because that's his family, right? So to speak, because his sons are the ones who rescue him. No, that's not Feanor. Feanor instead doubles down. He, tri <laughs> he triples down on this. He tells them that they're going to do whatever it takes to get the jewels back, no matter what. No matter who they have to kill, no, ma no matter what deeds need to be done to do it, as has already been seen by this point. And then he dies. Now, one would think that, well, this is Feanor, so of course he's going to be saying crazy shit like this, right? Uh-uh. Because guess what? In Golfin, who would seem to be one of the more rational leaders of the Noldor, also falls into this emotional despair state. And it's not for a long time that this doesn't happen. I mean, Pagolfin was known for being just as bad-tempered as uh, Feanor without the arrogance, but he was still a noble and a good leader. He wasn't rash. He wasn't one to just stab you in the back or betray you. However, during the Battle of Sudden Flame, when Morgoth launches yet another war against the Nordor and their allies in the north, this time, in order to break the siege that they have had him locked in for centuries at this point, um, things go badly. He kills several of the Nodor nobles and their families and their, wipes out their realms and the human allies associated with them. And he breaks communication between the Nodor that are fencing him in. So at this point, Figolfin has no idea what the hell is going on. And his fortress is under siege and everything is just going straight to hell. So he suddenly falls into this state of despair and thinks that the final judgment of the Noldor, which had been predicted by the Valar Mandos, had come. And he loses his shit and gets his horse, rides out alone to Angban, where Morgoth is based in the north, and challenges him directly to a duel. He literally rode up into his front yard, kicked on his door and said, you're a fucking bitch, get out here. That's crude, but that's exactly the intent that Fingolfin had. And um, just like his brother, Fingolfin does pretty damn well. He wounds Morgoth seven times. 
seven times that he does not heal from, mind you. But even though he, he is still killed, he is still remembered for that. But it is also another signature of that trend of not being able to let go. And this continues in Feanor's Sons. Kurufin and Kelugrum tried to launch a coup in Nargothon, which was a realm of their fellow Noldor, so that they can take control of it. And that doesn't work out, thanks to Baron and Luthien. And because of that, they run into them by accident, and apparently they lose their shit, and they try to kill Luthien out of spite because all the failures of their plans and everything is because of these two people. Not only that, one of the brothers is then defeated by Baron in a fight, which is impressive because Noldor are not supposed to be able to be defeated by humans, you know, at least if you understand the biology of everything. And therefore, this rubs salt in that wound because this, this wasn't another Sindar elf who the Nord, a lot of the Nordor also regarded as weaker, or even another Nordor elf, this was a mortal, a base born as one of the slurs for them goes. So all of that leads to one of them trying to kill both of them and it doesn't work and they flee. So you have that example of that manic expression. You have what ends up happening with Maedros who is the best of probably not just the brothers, but of arguably all the Nodor. He's probably the bet most noblest Nodor in the entire tribe, or at least within the top three, because he does everything in his power not to be like his father, not to follow after his curse, even to the point where his brothers, um, I'm not sure if they despise him, but they sure as hell don't like what he's doing. So. There you are. But having said that, Maedros does all this work, he does all this effort, and he survives all the wars that happen in Valerian just to end up succeeding and finally getting the jewels after him and his brother Maglor kill more elves to get them, and then being rejected by those same jewels because they have too much blood in their hands. They've killed too many of their own kind, and because of the stupid curse and that their father has placed them under and Maedros gives into his despair and he ends up committing suicide by taking one of the jewels with him into a volcano or a fiery chasm or whatever it's supposed to be. Um, a very, very tragic end for a, a noble elf. And his brother Maglor gives into his despair, but unlike the rest of his family who had these outbursts, he doesn't kill himself, but he does run away from any contact with any elves or humans after that point so that no one knows what the hell's happened to him other than he threw his Cimmeril that he took into the sea. And that's it. But, just like with McGolfin, it's not just Feanor's side of the family. Turgon has a similar um, situation happen to him when he ignores the recommendation from Umo to leave Gondolin, the hidden kingdom that they had worked so hard to build and establish and everything and was pretty much safe because no one knew where it was for a very long time until it was revealed due to uncontrollable circumstances. And Turgon, by this point, when he was younger, was aware that he had to have to leave at some point because that was the curse of Nandos at work and that um, for their survival, almost telling them, you're going to need to leave at some point. And when that point happens and arrives, Turgon doesn't do it. In his own pride, in his own arrogance, and I think in his own missing and desire to return back to Valinor that he had forsaken to follow after his family, um, he can't leave it. He can't bear to leave it. So, therefore, Gondolin gets sacked, elves are fighting and dying, and he's in the midst of this, and he falls into this total state of despair finally seeing that he has made this huge mistake. He's fucked up big time at, the, at this point and he can't deal with it. So rather than going out to fight like the rest of his family is telling him to do, he tells them to go away. I am no longer king. 
I'm gonna follow after this guy from this point on to get you know get the hell out of here, and I'm gonna stay here and I'm gonna die with my city. So, in a way, that's kind of suicidal, I guess you can say, even though he's not killing himself, as it were. So, and finally, even in his grandson, Killer Brimbor, who again is one of the nobler of the Noldor, he survives into the Second Age, and he sets up the Noldor region of Eregion in Middle-earth, and they're doing great. It's the bliss time of Middle-earth, and eventually he too screws up, making the Rings of Power under the teachings, teachings and influence of Sauron. And it says in the Downfall of Numenor that he got desperate at this point while his city is being sacked and to try and keep the Rings of Power from Sauron's armies. And he's fighting them at the door out of desperation to try and keep them out of that. And he's eventually captured, tortured, and dies. So, again, not a good end for another of Fenway's line. And I say all that basically to point out that there's that's this trend that keeps happening within Fenway's line. This trend of and an inability to let go of something that they hold dear. For Fenway, it was his wife, Muriel, and their dreams that they had together. For Feanor, it was the love of his father and the jewels that he possessed or that he made himself. For Fingolfin, it was that the time of the Nordor may be over and he needed to move on and let that go in order to survive and he couldn't deal with that. Kelligroom and Kurofin, that they had desires of empire even at the expense of their own people and it came to nothing and they also could not deal with that and so on and so on that's the running theme that you see play out here and that's why i kind of wonder that if eldar are not supposed to be able to pass on mental illnesses what would you call this because i don't know what to call it after that i, I really don't because in my mind, this goes beyond just being typical Nordor. You know, smart, gifted, strong, powerful, hot tempered, and violent. This goes beyond that because there, you have a bunch of different people doing the same thing, leading to almost the same results. So that says this is more than just a tribal trait, if you will. So those are my thoughts on. The curse of Fenway, basically, that um, lingers over that household. And, you know, if you have other ideas of what that might be, feel free to mention them. But that's what goes on in my mind. That's what comes to me when I read these stories and I read these characters and I see what they do. 